But I do want to thank all of you for joining us today for evidence-based best practices for blended course design. We are really quite fortunate to be joined by Dr. Katie Linder, the author of the Blended Course Design Workbook, who has a lot of great things to share with you today about blended course design and blended learning. So I will turn things over to her. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to keep them coming in the, the text chat and we will try to moderate those for her as well. But with no further ado, thank you, Katie. Excellent. Um, thanks so much, Stephanie. So I'm wondering if we can pull up my video just really briefly, just so I can wave to everybody before we switch back over to the slides. There you go. Your video is uh, front and center for us now. Oh, OK. Hello. Um, I wanted to just say thanks to everyone for coming to this event today. You are the second stop on my virtual book tour that I'm doing today and Monday and Tuesday the second stop of 10, so you're getting me fresh. Um, and I'm excited to share the book with you and talk a little bit about evidence-based practices for blended course design. I definitely want to encourage you to tweet the session if that's something you'd like to do. It will be available as a recording afterward if you need to deck out early or if you want to share it with any colleagues. Um, and I know Stephanie can share with you how to get that. I also will be following up with an email with some links and resources and a copy of the slides and things like that. So um, you'll have all of that at the end of today as well. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back over to my slides so we can take a look at those together. So you should have a slide on your screen at this point. It says evidence-based best practices for blended course design. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is really coming from um, the, the book and um, the different things that we were working on when we were thinking about how to help faculty to do blended course design in a way that was efficient, um, but also really effective. So just to give you a little bit of an overview of how this book came to be, um, this actually is based on a six-week faculty development program that I created when I was tasked by a president of my previous institution to train faculty in hybrid and blended teaching and learning. And I want to just mention, and I'll talk about this a little bit later too, I came in with a help, healthy degree of skepticism. I really wanted to make sure that what we were helping faculty to do uh, worked and that there was some evidence and, and research behind it. So one of the things that you'll see in the book is that there's lots of evidence and research for each chapter. But I'm also going to be talking today about some of the resources from the book that are available at bcdworkbook.com. And that's the book's website. There's some audio extras there, as well as a lot of handouts. And so some of the things I'm going to be referencing, you can go to that website and find. So let's go ahead and get started. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is blended learning, just so we're all on the same page in terms of a definition that I use in the book. I'm going to talk about what the research says about blended learning, some of the benefits and challenges of it, and the common pitfalls that I often see faculty having when they're working on blended course design. And then I'm also going to give some really concrete tools for effective blended course design that have to do with uh, course goals and learning objectives, with assessment design, and with creating effective learning activities. So first, let's start with just what is it, because I want to make sure everybody's on the same page with how I'm defining this. So we know blended learning is an increasingly popular phenomenon. And part of the reason that it's popular is because it actually has benefits for administrators, for faculty, and for students. So it can be kind of a win-win-win all around. From the administrative perspective, what they seem to really like is the idea of a replacement model, where there's face-to-face -face course time that gets replaced with online content delivery. And that means that the face-to-face -face course meetings can be cut by a third to a half while the credit hours stay the same. And for administrators who might be struggling with space issues on a campus, blended learning seems kind of like a miracle because you can cut your face-to-face -face time and you can now put two courses in the space of one. For faculty, because it requires additional technology integration and online content, blended learning is kind of a really exciting opportunity to learn new skills and have new tools in your toolbox. And one of the things that I found with faculty is that frequently they'll design things for a blended or an online learning environment, but then they start to use it in all of their courses too, even the ones that are just more web enhanced. So it creates all of these opportunities to just learn new skills that you can take with you into all of your different uh, course environments. And then for our students, blended learning can allow for more autonomous, active, and independent learning. And so students often get more choice in the blended learning classroom, 
they can uh, engage more in an active learning way with the different kinds of content that we're giving to them. And although they may kind of push against this a little bit in the beginning, oftentimes students actually really enjoy this. It gives them more buy-in in their learning overall. So one way to think about this is to think about it on a spectrum, where you might have traditional face-to-face -face on one end of the spectrum and fully online learning at the other end of the spectrum, and then you have web enhanced and blended somewhere in the middle. So the traditional face-to-face -face is typically without technology, although these days I think it's kind of hard to do that without having any kind of LMS or anything involved. Web enhanced is when you start to include technology into your classroom. And I would say that many of us, this is what we're doing. Um, at least part of the time, we have some kind of technology tool or something that we're including. Blended is when you do that, that replacement model, you take away some of the face-to-face -face and you move it intentionally online. And then of course, the 100% online is when you're doing fully distance learning and students are not meeting face-to-face -face at all. Now you'll see that I said in a couple of these situations that it can also be flipped. And this is one of those areas where I get the most questions, I think, from faculty who say, I don't understand the distinction between blended and flipped. So I wanna make sure that we talk about that. So many people conflate blended and flipped, and they really are different because blended is more structural and flipped is primarily pedagogical. So with blended, when we're talking about that a replacement model where you're moving things online, a best practice would certainly include moving the content delivery online to create more active learning. But this is not a requirement of blended. It's really more of a best practice. Whereas with flipped, Moving that content delivery online to create more active learning in the in-class environment is actually central to the definition of what it is as a pedagogical strategy. So you could potentially have flipped that's not blended, and you could potentially have blended that's not flipped. So even though they both require more technological literacy on the part of faculty and students, and that's I think where people kind of get confused about them being the same thing, one of them has that replacement model and one of them doesn't and one of them requires a pedagogical change, and the other one doesn't necessarily have that change. It's just a best practice. So there's a few different models for blended that I think it's helpful to think about as you're thinking about your course design and the ways that you wanna move your students through the content of your course. The one that we just talked about, the flipped model, is an online driver. And that's the kind of course where you are presenting content online and you want students to work through that before they come to class so that you can use the class time to help them practice or synthesize the material. So that one is really kind of um, front loaded where the online part is in the front. But you can also have what some people call a face-to-face -face driver where students in the face-to-face -face environment are getting that content delivery and they're starting to maybe have a demonstration or there's some kind of activity where they're really learning something for the first time and then the online component is used to help them do problem sets or to practice or to synthesize that material on their own time. So there's kind of different ways to think about how you might present the content. Another model that's becoming more popular but it's also pretty challenging is called High Flex. And High Flex is when you offer students the opportunity to be online or face-to-face -face at any time and it's their choice. So some institutions are creating this because they want to have a situation where their students can be very flexible, they have lots of access to the material, but it means that faculty have to be prepared for students to be in either environment at any time. So they could have two students in class and 48 students online, where they could have 48 students in class and two students online. And they're having to be really flexible with their materials. The last model that I think is helpful to think about is one that's really focused on experiential learning. So you may have heard blended also talked about as hybrid, and those terms are often used um, pretty interchangeably now. But when hybrid was first starting out, it was actually defined to include things like service learning, and it wasn't always tied to technology. And so I think when the term blended started being used, it was often being used more in conjunction with thinking about technology integration into a course. But you may also have a blended environment where you're really trying to encourage students to have a really experiential learning environment as well. And so one example of this might be incorporating service learning components into your classroom. But there's also some companies now, for example, that allow for international uh, group work and team-based learning, 
where you're taking a part of your online time and you're really giving it over to that experiential experience for your students. So that's another way to think about a blended learning model. But for typical, for typical faculty, most blended courses fall into either the face-to-face -face driver or the online driver in more of a flipped modality. So before we talk about what some of the research is saying here, I actually want to pause and see if there are any questions about blended modalities more specifically in terms of definitions and things that might, you know, in terms of the flipped versus the blended. Is there a different definition that's being floated around your campus? Any questions from folks about the definitional part before we keep going? If you do have a question, go ahead and put it into the chat box. All right, so we have one question. How might suggested class size change across types? So let me go back over here just to kind of look at this. So I think that one of the things that people consider with blended, and this is something I've certainly seen on different campuses, is if you are teaching a blended course, you might be able to have more capacity to teach more sections of that course as a faculty member. And so some campuses will actually sometimes double the amount of sections that a faculty member is teaching because they now have, you know, more space in terms of that online or that in face to face environment on the campus that the faculty member can teach in. So I've actually seen class size actually be more in that vein where people are adding sections. They're not actually making a course itself bigger because they may not have the classroom space on the campus to like double the size of a course, for example, but they do have the online space to add another section. And because you've taken away a classroom time, you know, let's say a Thursday class, Tuesday, Thursday class is now only meeting on Tuesday. Well, now that Thursday slot is open for another blended course. Now, I think that this really depends on, in terms of the, mo the, the models you're using, it would depend on the experience level of the faculty member. And I would also um, encourage the experience level of a faculty member with a particular course before I would scale it in that way. But I'm typically not seeing people, you know, really increasing the class size in a whole group. It's really kind of the segments of the course that might be added on. Um, and so faculty members are still, kind of working with the same amount of students in each segment, maybe 25, but they get another section added on. So I think that in terms of a face-to-face -face driver or with the online driver that's flipped, you could probably do a lot of different things. Um, and you would still be able to have the class sizes that you're typically used to, and you wouldn't have um, too much of an issue with that. So I don't know if you have a follow-up question, Lacey, or if that gets to what you're thinking there. Please feel free to, to draft a follow up in the comments if you want. All right, Lacey says, is there a specific cap on a section? I would definitely say this is discipline specific. So for example, if you're teaching a writing course, you would probably have a different cap than if you're teaching a course where a lot of the content delivery has typically happened in lecture and it's not a small seminar. So this would really have to do with the sizing of the classrooms on your campus, not necessarily the actual modality, I think it's way more connected to the discipline and the pedagogical strategies of a particular discipline. So I think right now the course sizes for writing courses, it's like 18 or below. So I wouldn't increase the size of that segment or that section because you have the option of doing blended, but you might be able to add a section um, that a, a faculty member is teaching. So I don't think there's a specific cap. I think it's really disciplinary and I think it's based on the pedagogical strategies of a particular discipline. All right, let's talk about the research. So the book itself actually includes in every chapter a research breakdown that gets pretty granular. Um, for example, talking about things like what we know about academic misconduct or talking about certain components of course design. So I'm not gonna go into all of that today just because of time constraints, but I did wanna give kind of a, a 30,000 foot overview of what do we know about the validity of blended classrooms and how they compare to face-to-face -to -face and online. So there have been a couple of meta studies, and these are things that I will send the, the slides out so you can definitely take a look at these later if you haven't looked at them yet. Um, and the meta studies happened in 2010 and 2013, and they were really trying to understand the current state of what's going on with blended online and face-to-face -face classrooms. And they're asking questions about the effectiveness of these things in terms of the learning outcomes that are happening in these modalities. And typically what these studies have found is that there's little to no difference between blended and online learning or face-to-face -face learning 
And then actually, in some cases, there's better outcomes in a blended learning environment. And there could be a number of reasons for that. But an important caveat about this research is that this is assuming a well-designed blended course. And just like our traditionally designed courses can not be designed well and maybe won't go very well because of flaws in their design, and we've all experienced that to some extent, um, in a blended environment or an online environment, it's the same. So the strength of your course design is really going to impact the learning outcomes for the students. In the blended environment, you'll hear me talk in a little bit about there are some other ways to kind of acculturate students for success. And I think that's another thing we need to be considering when we move students online. But for the most part, the studies have said that we're seeing an equivalency here in terms of face-to-face -face online and blended. So these are the two um, meta studies that I mentioned. One came out of the Department of Education in 2010. And the 2013 one is the most recent one that I'm aware of that's looking at these issues. Um, so these are definitely things if you're interested in thinking more broadly about the validity research, I would look here. Um, but there are definitely in the book more kind of uh, granular explorations about really specific components of course design that could be helpful to you. Another thing that's important to know about the research about blended and online is that in many cases, we're starting from a perspective of looking at what we know about traditional teaching first, and then trying to transition it or apply it to what we know online. So for example, there's very little research right now on the flipped classroom. We're still really building up that literature to understand what we know. But there's a lot of research on active learning. And so a lot of people have said, well, based on the active learning research, we know it's effective. Can we kind of make claims about flipped classrooms because it's so based on active learning. So there's some ways to kind of start kind of looking at that literature, but it's still very much a growing field in terms of testing out different modalities, different tools, different technologies to know what really works to help our students learn. So you heard me say earlier that I started out thinking about blended with a healthy degree of skepticism. I really wanted to know what works for faculty and what doesn't. And when I talk with faculty about blended, I really like to go over the benefits and the challenges. And I like to talk about what faculty and students need to know from the very beginning in order to be successful. So let's start with some of the benefits. I definitely think that blended has the option of creating more time for active learning in class, especially if you use a flipped model like we talked about earlier. It also lets students experience course materials in a range of ways. And this is especially helpful for students who might have disabilities or students who have just a range of learning preferences and they want to have choices about how they view materials and how often. It's also the option for students of being more autonomous and independent in their learning. And in some cases, this can really lead to student buy-in in terms of their own engagement with the material and they can really kind of take it and run with it in some ways on their own. And then lastly, I think a huge benefit of Blended is that it offers faculty a new skill set for their teaching and as I mentioned, it often gets translated into your face-to-face -face classroom and into other modalities when you learn new tools. But there are also some challenges. I think a key challenge, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, is that Blended requires more upfront design and planning. And a lot of this has to do with the alignment between the online components and the face-to-face -face components. And if you aren't thinking about that alignment really intentionally from the beginning, a blended course can actually be very confusing for both the instructor and the students because you're trying to kind of figure out how these things are related. So in a lot of cases, faculty struggle, especially in situations where maybe they've been doing more of their pedagogical planning on the fly and they're really reactive to their students. You can definitely change things as you go through a blended environment. It's not set in stone. But if you're doing things like video lectures ahead of time, it's a lot harder to do that on the fly than if you can try to kind of align those things from the very beginning of your experience. There's also definitely a learning curve of technology and active learning for faculty and for students. If you are used to using technology in your classroom and you're also used to teaching in a student-centered environment that uses active learning, Blended is not going to be that difficult of a transition for you. It's, a lot of it is actually going to feel very similar to you. And especially if you've designed courses using a backward design model, which I'm going to talk about in a little while, um, it's going to actually have a lot of similar and familiar components. But for faculty who have not really engaged with technology and have not really engaged with active learning, there are a lot of components of this learning design that will feel very foreign to them. And they'll need some time to think through that and to really think about 
what is it that's going to be best for them and for their students. And also, we can't assume that our students really understand how to use these tools. So there's also a learning curve on their end. And I'll talk in a little bit about the different kinds of things that students really need to know before they get into this modality. Another challenge for some faculty, but not all, is giving up some control over learning. Because the online components are usually pretty independent and students are needing to do a lot of that on their own, for some faculty, that's really challenging. It's really challenging for them to give up that time, that face-to-face -face time with their students, and they struggle. They really want to spend more time with their students, and maybe they were used to that, or they want a little bit more control or direction for their students in terms of the learning. So this can be a challenge for some faculty members. And also I found that faculty typically do need some level of assistance with the design. And there was, this was actually a big part of the reason that I wrote the book. I felt like there weren't really hands-on practical step-by-step -step guides to help faculty through this process if they didn't have on-campus resources to help them. Now, clearly you have amazing resources to help you. Um, so Centers for Teaching and Learning, Instructional Designers, Academic Technologists, all of these folks are really helpful resources to walk you through this, but it can be hard if you feel like you're doing it in a way that's a little more isolated. So the book was really designed to be used individually, but also in group settings for faculty developers. So they could really be thinking about how do we help faculty in the best ways possible. So I see Stephanie's noting in the chat feature, they're happy to help. So you definitely have some great resources on your campus. So let's talk a little bit about what faculty need to know before they get into this. What do you need to know before you're kind of jumping on the blended modality bandwagon? So the first thing is a clear definition of what blended teaching is. And we went over this in the beginning. I, there's a lot of confusion, I think, about that replacement model, about how it's related to flipped. And um, if you aren't clear on the definition, it can lead to some of the common pitfalls that I'm going to talk about a little bit later in the presentation. So having a clear definition is really key. And I think also just an awareness that the blended course design can require more upfront design and planning. So you want to block out some time in your schedule. A lot of faculty I found like to do blended course design over the summer when they have a little more time. And when we've offered faculty development in the past, it's typically been in the summer. It doesn't have to be. Um, but this is something to just be aware of, that you might want to take a little bit more time to think about to, how to transition into this modality. Sometimes we make assumptions about how our students use technology and the awareness that they have of different technology tools because we consider them to be digital natives. And in a blended course design modality, it's really important to remember that sometimes your students will use technology for more social reasons, for communication reasons, or for entertainment reasons, but they might not always be using those same tools for learning. And so we can't really assume that they're going to know what to do, and we really need to guide and model for them what they need to do with our different tools related to learning. Now, this is changing to some degree because students in high schools are starting to learn use learning management systems more. They're also starting to use things like tablets for their learning um, and different kinds of interactive games and things like that online. And so we're going to see this continue to shift over time, but we have to be careful that we're not assuming too much of our students. Another important thing to know is that students can really struggle with a blended modality because of the time management and the autonomous learning that's involved with it. Sometimes students really have a difficult time managing their time outside the classroom. They may be working or having other responsibilities, plus all of their other classes. And so to add in that component where they really have to be managing that on their own, it can be easy for students to fall behind. And so it's really important to set up structures within the class to help students succeed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but this is one of the big challenges, is that they can really fall behind, and it's difficult to catch up in a blended environment if you fall behind early on. And then the last thing I think faculty need to be aware of is that you shouldn't try to incorporate too many tools at one time and overwhelm yourself or your students. So this is something that, you know, it can feel like you want to jump in with both feet and really try to see what you can do. But part of the challenge of incorporating too many tools is that you might become overwhelmed, but you also might not be able to tell what's working. Because if you try too many new things at once and everything's going really well or something's not quite working that well, you're, you may not be able to, to know what to attribute that to, either the success or the failure. So incorporating one to three tools at a time can be a helpful way to make sure nobody's getting overwhelmed in terms of how you're doing the course design. All right, now our students. 
Our students need to know, first of all, that blended courses are not easier than face-to-face -face courses. Because they're spending less time with us face-to-face, -face, sometimes they will definitely think that a blended course is easier, that it's a bird course, and that they can just fly right through it. And in many cases, the opposite is true. Blended courses are a lot harder for our students, so they need to really have a sense of this going in. A lot of registrars will um, signal to students from the very beginning that the course is blended. But there are ways to signal the students in your syllabus and in your learning management system and in your first face-to-face -face meeting so that everybody is on the same expectation and they kind of know what they're getting into from the start. Students also need to know right away that they need to take more control of the learning activities outside the classroom. They need to be familiar with the learning management system. They need to know the tools for the course and they need to feel really confident in their abilities of what to do when and what they're responsible for on their own time. Blended courses also require more and different communication strategies. And I think many of us have probably experienced the situation where something maybe didn't go right in our online environment, a, a reading link was broken or a video wasn't streaming for whatever reason, and we don't find out until the next face-to-face -face class because no student decided to email and tell us. Um, and so in a blended environment, it's really important to have open communication strategies with your students so that you know if something isn't working or you know if there's any confusion with something being due at a certain time or you're not, you know, your students aren't sure what their responsibilities are. So it's important to have open email channels, um, online chat features, some people do online office hours to really make sure that students know how to communicate with you at any given time. And then the last thing which I mentioned is that students need to know that blended courses require using technology for learning. And for some of them, this might be really different than how they've used technology in the past. And even though this is changing, we wanna be careful that we're not assuming too much of our students with particular technology tools. So I'm gonna shift now into some of the common pitfalls. And a lot of these pitfalls happen because of course design issues. So I'm going to follow the pitfalls by talking a lot about the different ways to think about evidence-based course design for blended that's really going to make sure that we can mitigate some of these issues. So the first common pitfall that often happens with blended course design is a course and a half syndrome. And this is when many times faculty may not understand um, the replacement model, and so they just add in technology and they forget to remove things. And there, it's really important that you're doing almost a one-to-one -one correlation with what you're removing and what you're adding so that you don't end up just adding extra stuff and kind of inflating or bloating a course beyond its credit hours for students. So this is something to just think really intentionally about. It's also a really important reason to do that design up front ahead of time. Another common pitfall is attempting to design course elements in the middle of the term without kind of a plan for how to do that. So this is the more spontaneous course design that some of us might be more familiar with with our traditional face-to-face -face classes. And something to consider is that for many of us who've been teaching face-to-face, -face, we may have been doing this for a long time, for years. We feel very confident about our ability to come up with a small group activity on the fly or maybe to modify our lecture on the fly with a new, you know, um, uh, with a new media item that we want to add in or something like that. But in a blended environment, we may be less familiar with how to create a lecture video or how to create a multimedia item that we want to share with our students or how to add in a new quiz question. So adding these kinds of design course elements in the middle of the term can be challenging and stressful. Now, it doesn't mean at all that you can't make changes uh, throughout the term. And I definitely have had people say, you know, does this have to be set in stone? And absolutely not. But you really want to be careful that you're not leaving so many design elements throughout the term that you can't communicate with your students or that you don't have time left over for other things that you might want to be thinking about with them. Another common pitfall is a lack of alignment between the out of class and the face to face activities. A lot of people think that this is going to come and be kind of a common sense part of the class that you would have these items available and that you'd be able to really understand the relationship between these things and communicate it to your students in the same way that we communicate kind of face to face elements and homework elements. But when you add that extra time online, there is a little something that happens that creates a little bit of confusion. And if you're not kind of intentionally and purposefully telling students about the relationships between the activities they've completed online and what you're talking about face to face, it can actually feel like you're running two courses simultaneously, even though the content is obviously related. So it's important to think really intentionally for your students about those relationships between the two elements. 
A common concern I hear from faculty is that students are going to come to class unprepared. I hear this for the flipped model and also for just the online driver model for blended. And there is definitely a concern that if you put these things online and students don't do them, how can you ensure that you're going to have an effective face-to-face -face environment? Now, we all know that our students are really challenged for time. There's a lot competing for their time. But I've actually found the larger issue in a blended environment is that students don't know what they're responsible for. And they get confused about what's due when and what they really need to do to prepare for the face-to-face -face class. So the element here that's really important is really clarifying for students. What is it that they really need to do? And when is it, what's the due date for it? Is it before the next face-to-face -face class meeting? Is it sometime a couple days even before that so that you have time to offer feedback before they come back together face-to-face? -to Sometimes the syllabus is not clear. And so in those cases, students will fall behind and they will come unprepared, but primarily just because they don't know what to do. And then the last common pitfall that I often see, and this is particularly for folks who are used to doing more of their face-to-face um, -face lecture components, is that they may do a face-to-face -face lecture in their blended and then also put some of that content delivery online so students are getting things twice. Um, and this is also for folks who may be less familiar with active learning. They're not sure what to do. And so they end up kind of doing, you know, they fall back on things that feel more comfortable for them. And they end up using the face-to-face -face time really inefficiently um, because they're just not quite sure what to do with it. So it's a really important kind of component, I think, for people to be thinking about, um, again, on the, the um, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the chat and trying not to be too distracted because I know there's some great resources coming through there. It's really important to do that design ahead of time so that you can make sure that um, you're making these decisions when you have the time and kind of the brain space to think about it, not in the middle of the term. All right, so before I move into some of the course design components, I want to see if there's any questions about the challenges, the benefits, or the common pitfalls. So I see that Stephanie's posted a castle top diagram for help aligning in class and out of class activities. So that's excellent. I'm going to share some other templates and tools as well. Uh, but any other questions before I continue along? All right. So let's talk about some course design elements that are really important for blended. Many of you may already be familiar with backward design. And this is the idea that you're asking from the very beginning of a course design, what is it that I want my students to know and understand and to be able to do by the end of the term? We're trying to think ideally about if everything goes well, what will happen when the course is done? And this allows you to think about the evidence that you want your students to provide in terms of their learning and also the kinds of activities and assessments that you can create that will support those things throughout the course. So all of this is really founded and, and um, built off of course goals and learning objectives. And goals and objectives and outcomes, this is all language that I think kind of gets thrown around and people don't always know exactly what it means. So for the purpose of the book, how I define these things is that goals are really about what you want your students to know and understand. And they're a little more broad and perhaps a little more vague and harder to measure. Whereas objectives are really about the things you want your students to be able to do at the end of your course, the actions that they're going to take. And those are more measurable and more observable. Those are the things that you can see um, the evidence of their learning really clearly. So objectives are often tied specifically to goals. For example, you might have a goal that you want students to know the scientific method. But you might have three different objectives. They're going to list the components of the scientific method. They're going to apply the scientific method to a real world question or problem. And they're going to describe their use of the scientific method to a non-scientist. And if they could do all of these objectives and you're able to measure those things and observe them and you're able to assess them, you'll know that they are able to know and understand the scientific method more broadly. But something that people often don't think about with blended courses is that you might want to tweak or change your learning objectives specifically because of your environment. And so you might want to have things like students can communicate effectively via email or a discussion board, that they can demonstrate an ability to persuade in an online environment, that they can work with others in virtual settings, that they can demonstrate proficiency with particular technologies for your discipline or for a career that they're looking for, that they can read about and understand research online, and that they can evaluate sources in an online environment. 
You might also want to know if they can conduct research using online tools, if they can analyze online documents or situations, negotiate in virtual settings, demonstrate competency with team building, or access online information efficiently. So you might actually want to look at your blended course and think about what are the different kinds of learning objectives that you might be able to look at and how would you measure those specifically in a blended or an online environment. Then once you have kind of thought about that, you can maybe consider if there's assessments that you might use that might be especially helpful in online. So first I think it's good to start by just asking in a general way, based on what I'm asking my students to learn here, how can students best provide me with evidence of their learning? And even just brainstorm, what are all the different options for that? And once you have that brainstorm list, you can start to think about, are there aspects of student learning that would benefit from an online assessment specifically? And some of those learning objectives that I just listed would definitely fall into categories of things that might benefit from an online assessment. Then you want to think about if your overall assessment plan reflects how you can best assess your students in a blended course. So you want to think about all the different options, and I'm going to give you a couple of templates for how to do that in just a moment. And then lastly, are you giving your students multiple opportunities to provide you with the evidence that they have that they're achieving the learning objectives for the course? And you want to think about making sure that students are able to have lots of opportunities to let you know that they have learned the kinds of things that you think are important. So here are a couple templates that might be helpful as you're thinking through this. One of them is really just to try to divide in some ways your traditional face-to-face -face assignments or assessments with your what you think you might want to move online. And because we have so many courses that are web enhanced now, it's totally possible that you're already doing some of these things online anyway, and that you just want to formalize them a little bit. But you can start by looking at each learning objective and then what are the kinds of assignments or assessments you're using to measure that particular thing? And where is it going to be in terms of the modality of your course? And how do you plan to weight it? And this allows you to look at all of your learning objectives to make sure they're all covered, they're all being measured in some way, and that they're all weighted in the way that you want, that they're all being prioritized for your students. Another way to think about this is to divide your assessments into more formative assessments and more summative assessments. And the formative assessments are usually the ones that are relatively low stakes. They might not be graded. Maybe they're just offering you an opportunity to give your students feedback. Whereas the summative assessments are the ones that are usually a little more high stakes. These are the things that actually have a grade. So it might be an exam or a paper or a presentation. And you can think about where are those things occurring in each given week. And this also allows you to make sure that your assessments are spaced out in a way that you're not overwhelming yourself with lots of grading. You can also use this if you have multiple courses you're teaching to make sure that you haven't given yourself a million assignments to grade all in week five. And you can kind of try to stagger different assignments in different courses to make sure that your load is not too much throughout the term. The other resource that is on the book's website is this blended course assessment checklist. And I've offered just a few of the questions here. It's a longer checklist um, that's on the site. But it's really meant to help you in kind of a more holistic way to think about, are all of your learning objectives measurable? Have they all been aligned with some kind of component in your course that allows you to observe your students' learning? Are you including a nice mix that really lets your students showcase what they're learning in, in these important ways? All right, so let's talk about designing learning activities. This is kind of one of the more fun components, I think but also one of the more challenging for faculty who often ask me, how do I know that, you know, something should go online or something should be face to face? It feels kind of high stakes. How do I know where to put it? So I, I recommend starting with just a question of what have you done in the past that has worked well, maybe for this particular course or for a different course that's maybe related in some way in terms of structure. And once you know what's worked well and you have a list of things, maybe, for example, your students love small group work you can start to think about what belongs face-to-face -face and what could be moved online. And you also want to think about your constraints. Is it going to be really hard to move something online that would be a lot easier in a face-to-face -face environment? For example, maybe a role-playing game that you have. Then you can think about which activities involve more guided inquiry and which involve direct instruction. We don't always use this language. Direct instruction is really when you're giving students information directly, like, for example, a lecture or a video. 
and you're very clearly telling them what they need to learn. Whereas guided inquiry is when you let them play a little bit. Maybe you'll assign them a paper, but they get to pick the topic. Or you send them on a scavenger hunt of some kind, where they're really kind of working within some rules, but they get a lot of freedom. So you want to think about what activities do you have that are giving your students more autonomy and independence, and which ones are more directed, and try to have a balance of both. And then lastly, you want to think about the tools or technologies that are going to best help your students meet the course learning objectives, and you want to make sure is there anything in particular that could be especially helpful for them that's in your learning management system. So here's a couple tools to think about these things. The first one is just a template for aligned blended course mapping. And this allows you to think about your goals and objectives for each week, how much direct instruction or guided inquiry activities you're going to be including, and where they're occurring, face-to-face -face or online. It also allows you to build in social presence components. And social presence is really about how your students interact with each other, how they interact with you, and how they interact with your course content. We do this pretty instinctually face-to-face, -face, but for our online components, we might need to think about it a little more carefully. There's actually a whole chapter in the book that's devoted just to this. And then you think about your assessments, which maybe you have from the other templates that you've already created, and also metacogn metacognitive or reflective activities that you're asking your students to do to really think about what about their learning is working for them and what about it might be more challenging. On the website, you'll also find a weekly version of this course mapping template, so you can really get a little bit more granular. And you'll also find a blended course learning activities checklist that, again, asks you some of those kind of larger questions so you can be thinking about what are the things that are really going to work for your students and particularly for your learning objectives. A common question, though, I often get is, what are the best learning activities for out of class, in class? You know, how do I know which ones to move around? So here's some kind of um, basic rules to think about. For out-of-class activities, practicing skills or reading with a purpose, working on projects or performance tasks like papers or presentations that they might be giving, studying and synthesizing information through things like concept maps or study notes or guided notes, reflection activities where people might be journaling or doing self-assessment or self-evaluation, and any kind of revision work can be done really well out of class because they can take a little bit more time. For activities that are better in class, you might think about things like games or jigsaw activities where students are teaching each other, or think pair share where students think about something by themselves and then share with a partner and then bring that full their reflections back to the group. Presentations or formal tests and exams can also be good activities for this. This can also really be impacted by what do you feel comfortable with doing online. For some faculty, they don't want to move their formal exams into an online environment because they have concerns about academic misconduct. So that becomes a, a pretty easy decision to leave those things in class. But the really good news is that there's a lot of learning activities that work well for both, like role playing and case studies and games, discussion, small group work, peer review, problem sets, simulations, and demonstrations. All of these things are actually really effective in both face-to-face -face and online environments, so it should make your job a little bit easier when you're trying to think about where to move things um, for your blended course. The last template I want to share with you is one that I think is really important for blended, and that's how to choose the LMS tools that are going to work specifically for your class and for the pedagogical choices you're making. And I think that the, your learning management system is actually one of the strongest things you have to incorporate into a blended course. And there's lots of different options of how you might set up your course in your learning management system. So this checklist is really created to help you to think about what are the kinds of decisions that you might want to make um, as you're choosing the tools for your course. So I want to go ahead and open us up for um, Q&A and see if there are questions that folks have about blended or course design or technology integration. And so while I'm waiting for some of those questions to come in, the last thing I want to say is just I think one of the really powerful things about blended teaching and learning is that in the future, our students are really going to be expected to learn on their own and online. Once they leave our college environments and go into their careers and their jobs, when they're picking up new skills or when they need to learn something new, in all likelihood, they're probably going to be asked to do at least some of those things in an online environment. 
So when we can kind of help them for an apprentice model of learning how to do this in a blended classroom, it can be really effective for them in the future when they're going to be asked to do it on their own. So I think that that's one of the reasons why blended is becoming more popular is because we're seeing so many other components of our lives go online. And so this is one more area where we can really mentor, mentor our students about how to do this really effectively. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause there and see if we've got any questions from the group. All right, so Stephanie is asking, your checklist had an item to indicate if there's a limitation to the course that could be overcome when you convert to a blended course. And I think that this was specifically on the earlier checklist that I mentioned. All right, for the learning activities. And do I have an example to share? Absolutely. So um, I think a really good example for this is let's say you're teaching a course and you wanna bring in some outside speakers, but you're having a really hard time finding some outside speakers who are in your region to come in and do like a face-to-face -face panel with your students. In a blended environment, it might be really easy to pull together a panel using something like Google Hangouts or Group Skype where you could bring in people from anywhere in the world and have them talk to each other and have your students engage with that group. Or you could bring in an expert or an author or something like that. Someone who might not be able to travel to where your course is, but they could do something like that online in either real time or in some kind of recorded session where you're asking them questions and then students watch it later. So I think that there are lots of ways to think about, is there something you've been trying to do face to face that you've just really been struggling with for some reason. Maybe it just seems to take too much time face to face and you want to see if there's a way you can move it online so that it's really effective and for your students and they can kind of do it on their own time. Um, oftentimes this has to do with things like geography and timing. So if you have anything that you've been struggling with there, that could be a good example of this. That's a great question, Stephanie. Other questions from folks about blended course design or any of maybe the resources that I mentioned today. I want to remind you that they are all available on the website. If you want to just take a look, they're available as handouts. And so you're, you can feel free to download them and use them with or without the book um, if you think that they might be helpful to you. All right, so Lacey is asking if there are types of activities that should be that should be different for lower versus upper level courses, or perhaps even amounts of activities. Lacey, this is an excellent question. There's actually a section of the book, it's hard to reproduce in a slide, and so I chose not to bring it into this presentation, but there's a section of the book that talks about Bloom's taxonomy and how to use Bloom's taxonomy to pick different kinds of learning activities that might work well for your course. So Bloom's taxonomy is not going to map perfectly onto, you know, lower versus upper level courses, because sometimes we want to really push our students to do things that are in the upper level of Bloom's taxonomy. But Bloom's taxonomy, just for folks that don't know, it's a level of kind of six different cognitive areas that students need to work through when they're kind of mastering a new skill. And it includes things at the very bottom, like just remembering or recalling information. Like if you think about when you're learning a new language, you just need to memorize some words. Um, and it works its way up through things like analysis. And then at the top, it's really things like synthesis and creating new things based on what you know. So you can use something like Bloom's taxonomy to think about designing your learning objectives at the level of where your students are when they're coming into your course in terms of their cognitive level. But you can also use it to think about the different kinds of learning activities I want to include in a blended environment. And one of the things that we've done in the book is actually broken out different kinds of activities that you might have to face. And we've given examples of how they might transition to an online environment, maybe not in a one-to-one -one correlation, but in a way the face-to-face -face activity and the online activity are both getting to the same learning objective. And you might have something you do face-to-face. -face. Um, let's say, for example, you typically give a 45-minute lecture on a particular topic face-to-face, -face, and it's very interactive. Well, maybe what you would do online is not record the 45-minute lecture. Maybe you would record seven to eight-minute segments of that lecture, and you would intersperse it with quiz questions to kind of try to emulate the kinds of things you're doing in that interactive lecture that you would typically do face-to-face. -face. Um, so you can kind of try to think about 
depending on where your students are coming into the class, their cognitive level, what are the kinds of activities that would be the best fit? So we've given some examples for that in the book. If you Google Bloom's uh, taxonomy and course design, you're going to be able to find lots of different images and ideas of how people have aligned different kinds of classroom activities with different level blooms. There's a lot of really beautiful designed um, uh, visuals for that. One in particular, which I can send in the follow-up email or, or Stephanie might have a link, comes out of, um, I believe, the University of Iowa. And they can actually kind of a flash diagram where you can look at different levels of bloom and the different kinds of activities that might be associated with those levels. The other thing I would say in terms of amounts of activities is I would think more about the guided inquiry versus the direct instruction. Another way that some people think about this is pedagogy versus pedagogy. And pedagogy is, is typically defined as the teaching of children, and pedagogy is the teaching of adults. Although we use pedagogy very broadly when we think about college teaching and learning. Um, you want to be thinking about what are the different kinds of uh, levels of guidance that your students might need. So I think it's less about activities, um, about that, and maybe more about what are, in terms of amount, it's more about what is the content of that activity and how much guidance are people being asked to engage with. Um, and how much are they doing on their own and how much are they doing with your direction? All right, great. So Stacey also mentioned a question about ideal chunking of lectures too. Typically we know um, 10 to 12 minutes is kind of the upper end of video recording for attention. And this is for all of our brains, not just our students. We struggle when we go beyond that, that time frame. Thanks, Lacey, for your question. I understand it's a little bit of tinniness in the audio. I saw a note, so I'm going to go ahead and turn my video off and see if that helps at all. Um, and I apologize for that. All right, any other questions from folks? While I wait to see if there's any other questions that are going to come through the chat feature, I just wanted to mention a few things about the book that might be helpful for folks if you're thinking about doing blended course design. Each chapter does have a research overview. So if some of the things that I talked about with blended teaching and learning research were intriguing to you and you want to know more, know that a lot of the components of the book have research overviews in each chapter. So you can learn more about things like academic misconduct, constructive alignment, what we know about moving uh, assessments online, open educational resources, lots of kinds of things like that. I also include a lot of interactive elements throughout the book, including things like the templates and checklists that you saw today. So all of those are being included as well. There's lots of practical examples from instructors who have taught blended courses. So you can see some syllabi examples and different components of this, the syllabi as well that are kind of sprinkled throughout. Each chapter has a task list and specifically one for your learning management system design. This full task list is also included on the book's website if you want to take a look at that just to see the kinds of things that we talk about throughout the book. And also each chapter includes questions for faculty and administrators. So if you want a little bit of guidance, the kinds of things to be thinking through as you're going through your design, you can take a look at that. And then lastly, the book includes a glossary of terms. Not everybody knows all of these different kinds of things um, in terms of the, the terminology related to course design or technology. So that glossary is there for folks who might want a uh, little extra information. And I want to just thank all of you for taking this time to come to this webinar today and a little bit more of the best practices for blended course design. Uh, I'm happy to chat with you more and would love to connect with you on Twitter. And please feel free to reach out to me as well through my email, which you can find on the book's website. So thanks all very much for taking the time. It was really a pleasure to talk with you today. Thank you, Katie. Uh, this is Stephanie again. I we really do appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, and a big round of applause, virtual or otherwise, for you. It was a very, very helpful and informative session, I think.